Okay, good morning and uh, good afternoon, everyone. So after our uh, uh, first success in an international conference, that was also online conference, PASP in July. So from today, we are starting another uh, program that we call uh, PASP Colloquium, Promoting Applied Sciences in Pakistan Colloquiums. And uh, of this series, uh, I'm uh, very glad that the first speaker is uh, Dr. Kave Lahavi from Leiden University in the Netherlands. So he's also one of my uh, collaborators and uh, of course friend as well. So uh, he uh, did his PhD, uh, I guess uh, last year you finished, uh, isn't it? Well, it, uh, no, it's been longer. It's actually been a year and a half, I think. Yeah, almost, almost a year. Yeah. Yeah. So he completed his uh, uh, PhD with uh, uh, distinction actually, which is uh, yeah. uh, Dutch uh, distinction. And they call it, uh, uh, could you please say it in uh, good pronunciation? Yeah, yeah. Say again? They call it cum laude, it's a lot. Cum laude, yes. Latin thing, yeah. So this is, this is, this is a sort of, you can say the uh, stare imtiaz uh, of PhD. Uh, uh, and then uh, afterwards, actually, he continued his work in the same laboratory. Recently, he invented a new technique uh, to fabricate, uh, uh, you can say, like Jodhusan junctions or the quantum devices. Those will, uh, uh, you can say, uh, those can be fabricated within uh, tens of minutes, let's say 15 or 20, uh, Kavi will explain us uh, <laughs> in more details. But as I, I am, uh, uh, since last 10 to 15 years, I am also doing these kind of devices. I know that sometimes we need one week or a few days to fabricate one device. So then this technique will, uh, is, uh, I'm, I'm quite hopeful that it will uh, revolutionize uh, the fabrication yeah. techniques and this uh, quantum device technologies. Yeah. And um, so it's my pleasure to welcome Dr. Kabila Havi. that please uh, uh, over to you and floor is yours. Okay, well, thank you very much for the nice introduction, Shabazz. Uh, yeah, well, as you rightly put it, uh, making these type of devices has always been a challenge. And that's basically the motivation behind this work. So uh, today I'm going to show you how you can make functional superconducting devices by printing them exactly where you want them to be. Now, printing is an important word here because uh, it means that this is a fully additive process, uh, meaning that you don't remove anything from your material, you just add to your system. And that makes this a very uh, non-invasive and non-destructive method. But more importantly, uh, the entire fabrication process takes place in a scanning electron microscope. So you don't need to have a full clean room to make these devices. You could just, if you have a scanning electron microscope, uh, you're fine. And that makes this also a very accessible uh, technique because well, not every institute has a full clean room that can be dedicated to making superconducting devices. Uh, so, uh, well, that's basically uh, what I'll talk about, but before that, I want to maybe first start with our uh, superconducting devices and what they are. Uh, at a very basic level, these are Josephson junctions. And well, a Josephson junction is when you have two superconductors that are separated by some form of weak link or barrier. Now, this could be, uh, this weak link could be many things. It could be, a, it could be an insulator, it could be a normal metal, it could be a constriction, uh, but the, what's very important is that the, two, the weak link must be able to couple the two superconductors together by allowing their wave functions to overlap. You could also think of this as, well, the, you know, we have two reservoirs of Cooper pairs which leak into this uh, weak link and make it also superconducting. Now, as a consequence, now, if you, you can pass a finite amount of supercurrent through your Josephson junction. Now here, it's good to remember uh, what drives the supercurrent, because you see in the conventional electronics, 
you always need to have a, a potential difference, a voltage, let's say, to drive the current. But in a superconducting device or in superconducting electronics, by the very definition, there is no potential difference. You have, you know, you had you started with electrons, now you've formed Cooper pairs, and these Cooper pairs all reside in the in a single macroscopic quantum state. And therefore, they have they're on the same energy level. So then the question is, what is it that drives the supercurrent from point A to point B? And the answer, of course, is not voltage, because as you can see, the voltage is zero. No, the supercurrent is driven by the phases of the two superconducting wave functions. And that's described by the Josephson relation. But the phase here plays a very important role uh, because it adds a sort of a wave-like characteristic to your electrical transport, which is in a way you could say it's similar to light. Uh, for instance, if you apply a magnetic field to a Josephson junction and measure the critical current of your junction, how much supercurrent you can pass through your junction, you'll see the same Fraunhofer diffraction pattern as you would in the single slit experiment in optics. So here, you know, if you remember in, in optics, this phase difference, these wave fronts have a different phases, which is caused by the, uh, well, the variation in space on this screen. So you're, by moving along the screen, you change the phase of the wave fronts. And now in a Josephson junction, you can replace this. This role is actually played by the magnetic flux that uh, is applied to your Josephson junction. Uh, well, similarly, if you now connect two Josephson junctions in parallel, uh, this is called a superconducting quantum interference device, and uh, you'll see why. Uh, in this case, you have two Josephson junction in parallel, and if you now uh, measure the supercurrent, you'll see a double slit interference pattern. Uh, but what this means, in uh, to uh, to put it simply, it means that you can now do highly sensitive quantum interferometry measurements with an electronic device, and that's why superconducting devices are pretty much indispensable in all the emerging quantum technologies such as uh, well, quantum computers and so on. But they're also excellent sensors because this technique, uh, these, let's say these squids for instance, are highly sensitive to uh, magnetization and magnetic fields, current, voltage, and even temperature. The list basically goes on. Nowadays, they, you could use squids to basically also as an imaging technique for probing all kinds of things. Uh, you can find out more about it, uh, nano squids and so on in this nice review paper here. Uh, but for, uh, the question now we want to ask is, okay, uh, these are very useful and you can use it for all kinds of applications, but how do you make a device like this? Now, there are literally countless ways you could do this, uh, but in almost every single case, you rely on uh, thin film deposition and some form of lithography. And these techniques, uh, well, first of all, they, it, this could take usually, it's a, it's a multi-step procedure uh, and could could take up to days to complete. I mean, here is a kind of a ex very simple example of sort of a lithographic steps that you need to go through in order to prepare a device. So you need a lot of, first of all, uh, resources, sort of a clean room and lithography uh, equipments and so on. And it could also take quite a while, but more importantly, uh, these processes, especially lithography, it uh, sets some unavoidable restrictions on the type of system that you can uh, use Josephson devices for. Uh, for instance, you always need to have a flat surface 
which can undergo spin coating um, and you know a whole lithography procedure. This uh, your system also needs to be stable. Uh, to be so you can spin it at thousands of RPM. You also need to often heat up your sample and uh, also dip it, uh, immerse it in all kinds of solvents and chemicals. And often you also have to bombard your system with energetic ions. Uh, and on top of all of this, there's always an alignment issue. So for instance, you want to measure a very tiny magnetic particle or a very, you say, let's say you have an interesting system with a uh, broken time reversal symmetry that you want to study. It's always very hard to align your, you know, your, your uh, quantum device, your squid, with that exact system that you want, especially if you go to the nanoscale. What we wanted to do was to bypass all these processes using a direct right approach known as electron beam induced deposition uh, or EBIT for short. Now, the way that EBIT works is that you inject some form of a precursor molecule usually a, a metal organic compound uh, into the chamber of a scanning electron microscope. Now these molecules are stable until you expose them to a focused electron beam, at which point they dissociate and form a deposit on the surface. And this deposit in our case would be tungsten carbide. Now, if you scan your beam uh, carefully, you can make both 3D or 2D structures uh, and uh, you can, so you can go go both planar structures and 3D. Now this technique EBIT is not new. It's been around uh, probably, uh, well, since the nineties in fact, and people have used it to make very impressive structures. And uh, I mean, here I've included some examples where you can see that they've really truly make use of the 3D printing aspect of EBIT. Uh, and nowadays there's of course these computer aided uh, software that so you can have a very good control over your, uh, let's, the way that you print your structures. But, well, I mean, these are of course very impressive and now you might wonder how come we're not using them all the time in condensed matter and electronic for electronic applications. Uh, and for that, unfortunately, you must say that there is a very common general drawback uh, with, these, uh, with these structures that are made with uh, 3D printing methods. And this is not just, uh, let's say, an issue with the electron beam induced deposition, but pretty much all 3D uh, printing techniques that we know that work for uh, for nano devices or for sorry for nanostructures uh, they have the same problem and that is the fact that all these structures turn out to be highly resistive and that's not surprising because uh, more than 50 percent of these structures are actually made of carbon and the typical let's say mean free electron mean free path is less than a nanometer, usually only a few angstroms. So this is a very disordered and uh, system with, 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 a lot of, uh, with a lot of scattering. Nevertheless, uh, there were a lot of efforts to make disordered superconductors with EBIT. And a prime example of that is uh, of course, tungsten carbide. As uh, so you see, Tungsten in its pure crystalline form has a transition temperature of about 11 millikelvin. But once you, uh, of course, uh, let's say dope it or uh, amorphize it with a lot of carbon, then you can get it to be superconducting at about five Kelvin. Now, when they tried to make superconducting tungsten carbide uh, with EBIT, well, there were many attempts and uh, well, for quite, I don't know, more than a decade, let's say, all these efforts, unfortunately, um, didn't succeed. So in most cases, they would just have a very resistive system and the resistance would just go up uh, by lowering the temperature. And 
uh, these, there was no reports of a, a superconducting transition even. There was, however, uh, until, I mean, this is all, uh, uh, there was, there was, let's say, most of these structures just turned out to be insulating, let's say, until 2015, where a group finally succeeded in making superconducting tungsten carbide with this technique, but the transition temperature was about, I think, two Kelvin. And this, well, kind of uh, became, it, it became so widely accepted as the limit of what this EBIT can provide. And I must say that uh, two Kelvin is a little bit of an awkward temperature because most uh, cryostats, most uh, uh, measurement setups can actually go down to two Kelvin. But so it's right at the boundary of uh, most, you know, what, what the, the temperatures that most cryostats can reach. Uh, suddenly, if you now go, want to go below two Kelvin, it suddenly gets a lot more expensive and also a lot more uh, resource intensive. Now, what happened was basically uh, is that we, I mean, we started working on this project and of course we were quite new to this field. And I must say that sometimes being new to a field uh, works in your favor because uh, one day my bachelor student back then, uh, Tijo, uh, he came to me and he said he's made the superconducting tungsten carbide wire and the transition temperature was about two and a half Kelvin, which is great. I mean, this uh, is, was already a little bit higher than the previous reports. But when we, so when we looked into it, we found out that Tijo actually has been using, had been using a much higher beam currents than the previous reports. So in the previous reports that I showed you in the previous slides, uh, the usually, I mean, uh, they, if you want to do EBIT, you usually go for something in a picoamp region, region like let's say uh, 10, 20 picoamps or 100 picoamps max. Uh, but here actually Tijo is using, uh, for the first while he used five nanoamps. And then of course, for the next month or so, we uh, started to optimize both the beam current and other parameters. And at the end, we managed to get superconducting uh, tungsten carbide with a transition temperature of about four and a half, five Kelvin, which is a, well, relatively comfortable temperature to work with, at least uh, for experimentalists. But more importantly, we found that depending on how we scan the electron beam, we can make both superconducting and uh, metallic, but not superconducting components. And that provided us with the means uh, to make our Josephson junction. Uh, for instance, uh, so this is how basically how we did it. Uh, uh, in, in this case here, now we, if you scan your electron beam slowly, you, we found out we can make uh, you know, the electrode wires for our junctions, the superconducting components. But if we scan it fast, we can make non-superconducting components. And that is basically how we made our Josephson junctions. So we first deposited two superconducting electrodes that were separated by about 150, 160 nanometers. And then we connected them using this, uh, normal metallic weak link, uh, which was deposited at a faster rate. So it wouldn't become superconducting on its own. And well, I mean, it took again, a lot of trial and errors uh, to get all the parameters right. I think by the time we had our first Josephson junction, uh, the sample numbers were in triple digits. Uh, but once they worked, uh, oh, so this is basically one, what the final junction looks like. Um, but once the devices worked, they were surprisingly reproducible. So uh, use, if you use the same uh, EB parameters, let's say the same scanning speed and same beam, you'll always end up with the same 
critical current. I mean, here you, I'm showing, what I'm showing you is basically the current voltage characteristics of two different junctions. And you'll notice that one has a much higher critical current than the other. And that is because the weak link for this junction was deposited uh, at a slower rate, let's say with a higher dwell time in the EBIT language, which means that this weak link has a lower resistivity. And the ones I'm showing in, up, uh, in the upper panel, those are deposited using four millisecond uh, dwell time, and therefore they have a higher resistivity, which results in a lower critical current. So, uh, sorry, excuse, excuse me. <clears throat> I would like to ask a question here just Please, to yeah. uh, make it clear. So your electrodes are also tungsten carbide and the weak yep. link is as, uh, also car carbon, uh, sorry, uh, tungsten carbide. carbide. So, uh, and all of this device is fabricated by scanning electron microscope. All of them, yeah. Uh -huh. Good. yeah. So uh, basically, uh, maybe I'll go back one slide. Uh, as I said, everything you see here, except of course these, uh, the you know the, these are just some gold electrodes, that, uh, the ones that you see here in uh, light gray they, that we use for testing. So here, I mean, I'm, we're passing the current from here to here, and using these two electrodes, these gold electrodes, uh, for so measuring the, the voltage. Electrodes were already on your uh, chip. Yeah, I mean, you basically we have one chip with uh, 25, uh, uh, let's say uh, 25 of these four probe contacts. Yeah, good. Uh -huh. Yeah, so that's already there. I mean, you could already get any, uh, let's say this is not part of the junction, let's be clear. These are just normal metal wires that we use for, you know, just connecting, to, making connections to our Joseph and junction. Sure. Uh, apart from that, everything is done in the scanning electron microscope. And as I said, this is simply by just changing the scanning speed in this case, or this, how much you linger at each point while you're scanning the uh, electron beam during EBIT. We can get both superconducting and non-superconducting, but metallic components. And that's how we make the junction. So yeah, good. Good. are there any other questions at this point? Anyone, if uh, you want to ask a question at this stage, you could. No, I guess we can continue. No, okay, well, well okay. Hopefully there'll be more later. So uh, moving on, okay. So, and here I was just basically sh uh, showing, what I'm showing you here is, uh, the resistivity of the materials that we use for the weak link as a function of well dwell time, which you can think of as the scanning speed of the electron beam. And you see that there is a quite a large range which we can vary and tune the resistivity of this weak link material. And the lower the resistivity, of course, the higher the critical current. So we have now with 10 milliseconds, we have 40 microamp critical current. But if you go for four millisecond dwell time here, which is more resistive, we have a smaller critical current. And uh, so it gives you the, it gives you an, let's say a, a, a parameter that you could use for tuning the uh, Josephson transport, how much supercurrent can go through your Josephson junction. But one thing that I really was, uh, I really didn't expect was how reproducible this process is. So it's been now, well, pretty much a year and I've had four different students at uh, four different, of course, you know, uh, four different uh, uh, months or so, I don't know, they're, they're like months apart to make the same junction with the same EV parameters and in every single case, we get the same critical current. And that is unheard of. I mean, uh, I think Shabazz would appreciate that even when I make uh, use, let's say conventional lithography to make a Josephine junction, I, I can never be sure of what the critical current is going to be. There's always, let's say 10, 20% uh, margin of error at least. 
But here it doesn't, uh, it, times and times again, we use the same parameters and we get the same thing, which in a way at first I was surprised because this is, a, as I said, a very disordered and dirty system. In fact, more than 50% again, is made of carbon and oxygen. And we're doing all the depositions at 10 to the power of minus five millibars. So it's not even in UHV. But what I think is happening is that well, there are two different approaches to getting reproducibility. Uh, one approach, of course, is to go to a very, very pure, ultra pure, ultra clean system where you get rid of all impurities and defects and you control your system that way. Uh, but the other approach is that you use a system, use a material that is by its very nature already very disordered. And it's, it's in fact so contaminated that it doesn't even, it's not even sensitive to day-to-day -to -day variations in the impurity levels. Uh, I mean, that is the only way I can explain why these devices are so reproducible. But of course, you know, I mean, here, this is just a critical current. And uh, well, the way to know that you've made a Josephson junction, uh, because of course, there's a big difference between just having a, a, an inhomogeneous wire or, or uh, than, and, and having a Josephson junction. Uh, the way to test it is by irradiating your sample with microwaves. And in that case, you, uh, this is a beautiful experiment. Uh, what you have, uh, you'll see quantized steps in your current voltage characteristics. And the height of these steps is simply uh, the, your, the frequency of your microwaves times uh, Planck's constant over uh, 2e, the charge of two electrons. And, th and that would be, of course, this phi naught, the fluxoids. And uh, well, we, of course, uh, and that's basically what I'm showing you here. These are Shapiro steps taken from devices that were printed in the scanning electron microscope. And on the right panel here, we uh, also have the, uh, the response of our junctions as a function of uh, microwave power. So you increase the microwave power and you'll see all these uh, Shapiro steps here again. Uh, I think on the bottom panel, you see them more clearly where they emerge as a function of microwaves. Now, more there, of course, if you want more details, you could, uh, check out our paper, which uh, is now uh, online at ACS Nano. I've also uh, made a YouTube video from our channel uh, where we go to the lab and actually make a full device from start to finish and show that show how easy it is. And you can basically do everything in, uh, in this case, we say less than 30 minutes. You could probably do it less, uh, but Apart from being, of course, you know, a fast technique, this is uh, very useful because of, because of the, as I said, you know, making devices such as the squids, interferometers. And that's something we've actually already done. So here, uh, this is the work of uh, my current master's student, uh, Timothy, who's, uh, who actually has made it here. I'm showing you it's a squid. It's two Josephson junctions that are, uh, connected in parallel. And if you now apply a magnetic field, again, you'll see this uh, beautiful uh, double slit interference pattern. And now if you bias your system with a, a finite current, and uh, you'll see these voltage oscillations as a function of uh, magnetic flux. And recently now we've uh, uh, I've formed a collaboration with uh, uh, our friends in Tübingen, that's a uh, Dieter Kolle and uh, Reinhold Kleiner's group, who are, well, world leading experts on squids. And uh, they're currently, uh, uh, they've joined our efforts to characterize these squids and use them for real applications, such as reversing, uh, such as measuring a magnetization reversal of a nanoparticle, of a, uh, let's say, a nanomagnet. Uh, but this is now currently is an ongoing uh, collaboration. Uh, but in parallel to that, uh, my uh, students are now 
uh, and I have also been working on uh, going 3D, making 3D structures. Uh, this is the work of my student Nick, who basically introduced this, uh, maybe this Python code that had, gave us much better control on how we scan the beam. Uh, so he had a lot of fun with it, as you can see here. Uh, but more importantly, we actually have now arches that show a superconducting transition. And uh, this is, uh, of course, would be very interesting because now we can actually make uh, superconducting transition that, or superconducting networks that are not limited to planar geometry, but they can also go uh, in all three dimensions. Uh, but to really truly get a handle on that, we are also now working on uh, simulate uh, well these uh, Monte Carlo finite element hybrid simulations because well the picture I showed you in the previous uh, at the beginning which was just the mo molecule goes in and gets dissociated and forms a deposit that is a grossly simplified picture uh, if you look if you look more closely you'll see that there are a lot of very complicated mechanisms that take place uh, that are almost next to impossible to solve analytically. Because at each point we have the incident electrons, there are also secondary electrons that come from the surface. Now the secondary electrons have a, a better chance of dissociating, but there's less of them. And at the same time, you have heating, you have uh, charging. There is so many things that need to be taken into account. And uh, well, recently these, these simulations actually have be, you know, really taken off and they're doing a great job in uh, simulating their processes. And we are getting to the state that we can, before the actual deposition, and instead of just trial and error, we can simulate the growth and then go to the machine and print out our structure. Uh, now, before I get to the questions, I want to acknowledge uh, my colleagues in Leiden, uh, well, who have been supporting this project. And I also want to acknowledge our uh, collaborators in Tübingen, uh, who are now uh, helping us with uh, doing very uh, high sensitivity measurements of noise and so on to uh, characterize our devices. And uh, I think with that, I'd like to end any, and now, uh, well, we'll have some questions, hopefully. Thank so, you, Kavi. Thank you. Go ahead. Please, go ahead. Uh, please uh, take over. Go ahead. Yeah, th thank you, Kavi. It was such a wonderful talk. And, you know, this gives us, a, us the feeling why the world is so hopeful about quantum information system and quantum technology to, to, to take over very soon. And uh, this, it's, it's because of these developments that, you know, uh, in bits and pieces which are giving us this belief uh, so the floor is now open for questions. Uh, please, anybody who would like to ask Kave their questions, uh, please go ahead. Anybody from the audience? I guess Vokas is Vokas Tanvir. I guess he have question. Hi. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good morning. Um, I I just didn't know the protocols whether I be raise hands or <laughs> the floor is open. <laughs> Yes, please go ahead. Yeah, uh, sorry, I will not be able to open my computer, uh, the camera today because it's it's been mental chilling. Just um, sure. very exciting to see um, uh, your work. I'm really interested in in, in knowing uh, because what we are trying to do here is industry four and automation, right? So if you are going to present your um, your methods to the industry to be taken over in the semiconductor industry, you are very mindful of the industrial batch production rates and how much batches of this can you produce per uh, per time I, I i didn't think that you touched upon the time of deposition here what 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 what's going on okay. and specifically uh, how much um, uh, batch production per uh, per minute or per sample or per uh, chamber uh, because basically in sputtering or pld or some other uh, devices the bigger the chamber you can you can have the biggest uh, aspect ratio. So for the industry, it looks very good and it looks like it's controllable. For the industry to take up this, they will be really interested in to knowing how much per minute or per batch you will able to give and uh, into, in, improve the automation. Yeah, yeah. no, no that's, that's a very good question. Uh, well, so 
let me put it this way. Uh, I don't think this is, well, I mean, my, I don't want to be uh, short-sighted. Okay, so let me put it this way. To make a full Josephson injunction or this uh, squid that you see here, this, uh, each device takes about 10, 15 minutes, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. But this is by no means, uh, let's say, optimized. I'm sure you could automate this better. Mm -hmm. And uh, this really depends on the, how the industry would focus electron beams develop. I mean, there was um, also all these efforts to make uh, multi-beam uh, machines that you can have multiple focus electron beams. Mm -hmm. And with something mm -hmm. like that, then you can, of course, uh, think about you know, mass producing this. <coughs> but if you just have to do one device at a time, then... Uh, no, I, I'm, I'm, uh, I, I don't think this can compete with uh, the conventional fabrication techniques. Mm -hmm. uh, however, uh, I, must, uh, I should remind you that the conventional fabrication techniques really fall short when you go to non-planar uh, surfaces. So, so for instance, one mm -hmm. of the things I'm doing now is uh, on uh, cantilevers. Uh, this technique is completely compatible if you have, for instance, the tip of a cantilever for atomic force microscopy or these things, you can easily incorporate this. Whereas in, uh, if you want to just implement that in, uh, you know, if you want to do that using, you know, uh, silicon technology, the, the, mm. uh, that would, of course, be extremely complicated and tedious. Yeah. So uh, I must say that this is not a the process, let's say, is, I don't think this is yet a technique that you can just mass produce devices at, you know, uh, hundreds of it at a time. It's uh, more, you think about it, uh, it's more for, let's say, more tailored applications, depending on, uh, on let's say you want to place a sensor on a specific, procedure, uh, a specific position that you can't do with a normal fabrication. Sure. So let's say within the vacuum-based technology, within the vacuum-based deposition technologies, it, it's touching a, a, a pretty early TRL level uh, for batch production. And uh, we can, you can basically touch a niche market that is mostly yeah. interested in low um, or a not so high rate of production, but basically more accurate production Exactly. Um, in that case. Uh, very interesting. So basically, yeah, the, as you can see, the with the, the one with the highest beam technology or one with the strongest electron microscope wins here. And uh, the more, <laughs> the more uh, Monte Carlo simulations that you have, the more deposition that you, the, the, your, your fine students are doing, I'm pretty sure uh, this can be optimized. I would, I would, uh, as a final comment, I would really yeah. um, appreciate that you, uh, this Monte Carlo and uh, especially fuzzy, fuzzy logics and other kind of uh, deposition control methods that can reduce the experimental uh, time uh, exactly. for your students and other uh, is very important for uh, as we move towards the industrial revolution so um thank you thank you for the talk yeah i, I, I really I, i'll follow uh, how how this goes in future thank you thank you I mean, that's, a, that's an important point i just want to add one thing that you're yeah. absolutely right and I, I'm, I'm, i should mention that this techniques be mean just deposition uh has it can also be done with ions so if you have a focused mm -hmm. iron beam, you can also do right. this deposition. Oh, okay. Okay. So then it becomes destructive, right? That, exactly. Like so that's I, uh, what <laughs> I want to say that this is, then it becomes also a lot more, I mean, destructive is one thing, but it becomes a lot harder to simulate because it's not just additive. You're also removing material. Yeah. Yeah. And then yeah. It, it becomes very hard to do the simulation and control yeah. your structures. Yeah. 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 No, no. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, Akas. It was such a wonderful discussion. Um, so, any other question? Uh, I, I would like to ask uh, one question here. Sure. Uh, so, just like actually, I was going to discuss upon this, you know, touch upon this point of. Uh, a, um, iron, um, you know, milling, sort of. Yeah. So how different is this procedure from iron milling? Because in iron milling, you know, sometimes there are like impurities induced and which might be detrimental to these kind of sensitive devices. So have you, do you have any experience or do you envisage like something coming out of uh, Yeah, that? I mean, so I use focused iron beams all the time. I mean, as Shabazz knows, that's basically, uh, 
yeah, my, my expertise in nanofabrication is focused on iron beams. Uh, this is a new development, but this is for a very different thing. So let's say with iron beams, first of all, uh, you don't uh, you don't have this because now I really can play around with my dwell time, the, the, with the scanning beam, uh, how how fast I speed it, how, you know, the speed of the scanning and how much current there is. With iron beams, your your parameters are first of all, you know, parameter space is much more restricted because if you stay in one spot too long, you know, or, or, or if your parameters are, you might just end up spottering everything. And uh, so that's, let's say there, you know, it really depends on what it is that you're trying to do. Here, uh, the iron beams techniques work fine, but of course, whenever you use iron beam, you have, uh, you, you, know, you remove materials, not just from what you're depositing, but also everything around it. That's and, and this is basically, that's what I mean by uh, being an additive technique here. Here, mm. there's, you, you never remove anything. You don't even touch anything around it. Mm. Sure, the system itself is, uh, is disordered. Whatever you deposit is, is uh, you know, it has a lot of impurities in it. But, right. you know, once you're in the subconducting state, it, it doesn't really matter. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. But, but you know what, uh, like this, the, these inclusions or the, uh, or defects or whatever or impurities maybe it is the cause of uh, like you know non-reproducibility sometimes so what do you think well that that normally is the case i would say well you know defects are bad you don't want you don't want them you want them to be uh you want to avoid them that's the case in normal superconductors but yeah. in disordered superconductors it's a different story mm -hmm. there I mean, the, the very nature of superconductivity stems from this disorder. As I said, if you have a pure tungsten, it would, it would have a transition temperature of 11 millikelvin. So the disorder here actually helps you to get to the superconducting state. Right. And uh, there, but then it, it, it becomes, you know, your, your mean free path, these things are so short and uh, that day-to-day -day variations in, let's say, vacuum level, or let's say, uh, I mean, this is a machine that belongs to the Institute. So biologists use it, chemists use it for different kinds of things. I never know who was, you know, what kind of sample was in there before. But again, despite all of that, you know, we always end up with the same electrical properties in our devices. And that's something that you would never be able to do with, you know, clean superconductors deposited in ultra high vacuum and so on. That's right. So it's by it's just the nature of the disorder superconductors <laughs> actually here comes comes in handy. Yeah. Oh, which, which is actually yeah, very very interesting indeed. Um, okay, so any other question uh, apart from that uh, from the audience? Please, you can either just turn on your mic and ask the question or raise your hand. I see a lot of people. But uh, hmm. yeah, so uh, I guess I should ask a question if uh, you are will allow me. Please. <laughs> yes. Okay. So my question is about the uh, the width of this wire, uh, the superconducting wire that you used. So what yeah. minimum you could achieve? Because I, if I'm not wrong, uh, uh, the uh, this uh, coherence length of tungsten carbide should not be much longer, more than five nanometer. It should be wrong about that, isn't it? No, but coherence length is only, yeah, it's about six nanometer, which by the way, that's, that's a very important point. Uh, I, I, I'll, I'll go back to the width in a second, but here's one, another advantage of disorder superconductors. They have a very small coherence length, like in this case, it's about six nanometers, which means that they have a very high critical field. And, and that is basically one of the main attraction here why, uh, you know, our friends in Tübingen are, are, are interested in this uh, type of squid is because you could potentially go to four Tesla, five Tesla and operate your squid. You won't be able to do that with, let's say uh, something like niobium or aluminium uh, because where the coherence length, I mean, the critical fields are much smaller. <laughs> let's say after this, uh, this is, you know, this puts this type of squid on the same level as the ones made with uh, YBCO or high temperature superconductors in terms of their robustness to the magnetic fields. But 
Now you asked me uh, about the coherence length. Is it indeed yes? It's uh, about six nanometers. But uh, why would that <coughs> relevant for the thickness? So uh, what is? If you could uh, ask me, uh, Shabazz. So your question was uh, the width of width of your uh, actually this uh, wire, the bridge. Ah, the the, the weak link, you mean? Uh, not uh, only the weak link, because the weak, weak uh -huh. link is, uh, is not uh, superconducting. Right. The superconducting electrode. So what is the width of that? And uh -huh. thickness is also important, of course. Sure. So as you can see, they look, they have this kind of a tube shaped morphology. They, they have, they, they almost look uh, like, they, they, they basically look like tubes. Mm -hmm. And the uh, width is well, uh, now can get it to be about 200 nanometers, mm -hmm. and the thickness is also about two, 300 nanometers. So it's about two, 300 nanometers. And now, this is, yeah. It's okay. Okay, okay sorry. Uh, I, I, I was going to say that this is relatively large dimensions compared to, the, you know, the, the usual EBIT structures, where, which can be, you know, 10 nanometers, 20 nanometers even. And that's because they're using a much lower beam current. Here we have, you know, we're using a much, first of all, uh, higher beam current means that you have a bigger spot size on your surface. And that's one thing. And secondly, uh, as I said, the process, the EB process is a little bit more complicated than uh, what I showed you, because here is the incident beam. In our case, this incident beam is only the diameter of the spot is only about, I think, 40 nanometers. But why does this wire look so much, you know, it's so much wider? That's because of the secondary electrons, which are also contributing to this dissociation of the molecules. But can we go thinner? Can we make them smaller? Uh, yes. I don't know how much smaller, but uh, because that hasn't really been my priority so far. But um, potentially, I think it should be easy to go to 100 nanometer with, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, very good. So it means we can also try uh, superconducting nanowires with this technique. And on the, on the other side, uh, did you try other than tungsten? No. no. Can we, can we? Yeah. Okay, any other question from the audience? Any last questions? We can take maybe one more question and we'll close this session for today. Hello. Hi. Yes, oh. please go ahead. May, may, I, may I ask one thing? Sure, please. Please. Uh, uh, thank you so much for a nice talk. May I ask, uh, for instance, uh, <clears throat> How much uh, resolution maximum ca can we go for them inside the atom in the future? Do you think so? Uh, this is no, this technique won't give you atomic resolution. No. So, uh, the good thing about this scanning electron microscope is that you can, you can go from easily from millimeters to uh, tens of nanometer. You know, the scanning electron microscope, mm -hmm. that's what I like about it. If I mean, if you have a, let's say, scanning tunneling microscope, sure, you can have atomic resolution, but your hands are pretty tight because. You can only see an area which is only, let's say, one micron by one micron. So it's good, but for a very different application. I mean, you can't just put in any device and just look at a very specific spot in your system. You'll have no idea where you're going to scan with the scanning tunneling microscope. But scanning electron microscopes, they're, they're very, they'll cover a very wide range. They cover from millimeters down to tens of, you know, a 10 nanometer or so. So that's the advantage of this scanning electron technique. And, uh, but in terms of uh, that, that's basically, and that's what sets the limit on the resolution of uh, how small can we make these devices and so on, yeah. Uh, my, my question was more general. Uh, may I just, uh, uh, whether it is possible, it would be possible in future to let look into the atoms like quarks, for, for instance, uh, how it would be possible, what type of, um, for, instance, for instance, uh, in SCM we use electron as a beam or what type of particles co would be required to look into the atoms like quarks, for instance. 
would it be possible so in future look or not? Nuclear. Uh, you mean to look at the nuclear? So uh, let's say you want, uh, if you want solve atomic resolution, then uh, yeah. there is no. I don't know any imaging technique for that. No. Uh, there you need a large hadron collider or something to uh, even be sensitive to those interactions. But uh, imaging, I think we're far away from imaging that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. So might be, I don't know, might be there are some uh, particles like um, having, I don't know, but a lot of particles, maybe some streams could be used. I don't know. I just want yeah. to know your comments. Sure. No, but I mean, uh, you know, you, uh, electrons are very easy to produce, you know, and, and, and uh, yeah. compared to yeah. anything else, uh, when we go even for, you know, uh, if you want to get, let's say, neutrons, even then, you know, you, you'll need to, uh, it becomes extremely more complicated and you need yes. a lot more facilities. Yeah. But I, I don't think they're, they can be used for imaging the same way as electrons. I mean, yes, not in near future anyway. Yeah. Actually, there are some, some ways, for example, uh, where, where you can image the atom. For example, uh, take the example of uh, how the atomic force microscope tips are made. When the atomic force microscope tips are made, you know, through ion beam lithography, so there is a microscope which gives you the indication whether how many atoms are remaining at the tip. And ideally, you want only one atom at the tip. So there are microscopes which can see one atom. Oh, know, yeah. I mean, they do that already uh, with, with tungsten. So the, there is a helium iron microscope. It's the, let's say, I say uh, in terms of uh, focused beam microscope, that's the most sensitive one, which has mm -hmm. a soft nanometer resolution. And right. there, exactly as you point out, there is a, uh, the, the source of the microscope, which generates okay. this focused beam, has a trimer. It has a very uh, sharp tip with three atoms at the end. Absolutely. And uh, there you can actually even see the three atoms sort of, uh, yeah, but um, so that's, I mean, they're, they're making, uh, of course, the focus beams are really uh, taking off. So who Absolutely. knows what would be the next thing? Yeah. So, so th thank you, uh, uh, Dr. Lahabi and uh, oh, all you. the audience. So we uh, thank you for your for, for a wonderful talk and we thank the audience for making it very interactive and uh, very engaging, uh, very good questions, especially from Wakas uh, and made it, you know, uh, much more interesting for, for all of us. So we'll keep on coming up with new sessions that, like, like this one and we hope that we can interact more in future with all of you. So thanks a lot. We call it a day today. Okay. Well, it's been a pleasure. Right. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, <clears throat> thank you very much, uh, Kavit, uh, uh, for your very nice talk. But here I want to make a last comment about our uh, next uh, PASP uh, colloquium. That would be about uh, uh, cannabis. So like you can say bang, jars. <laughs> so that will be uh, very interesting, I guess, uh, for uh, yeah, many people because uh, it will also include uh, uh, plant biology and uh, also the interest of Pakistan government. Yes, but we will we will not talk about how to get intoxicated with the, <laughs> with the cannabis. We'll talk about the scientific aspects of cannabis. <laughs> yes, I think it's very informative and.